we have to learn the lesson of the Chorban. No abandonment. And from my standpoint, it's real personal with me. I know what abandonment is like. And it doesn't feel very good. I spent 30, 35 years abandoned. And I came home absolutely determined not to let anybody suffer from that ever again. Jonathan Pollard, hello. Hello. Thank you for accepting uh, to answer our questions here at Studio Carlita. We are the leading uh, French speaker digital media here in Israel. My pleasure. You've been living now in Israel for almost two years, but you have been for many, many more years a fine observer of the Israeli society. Is there a difference in between uh, what you thought about Israel and what you see here on a daily basis? Yes. Uh, the last time I was here... Uh, was in 1984, and the difference between the country, not just materially in terms of infrastructure and buildings and things like that, and now is between night and day. In fact, when I got here, I didn't know where I was. I would be forgiven uh, for feeling that way because uh, the Ayalon Expressway wasn't built when I was here. None of the roads were built. The uh, skyscrapers were not built. Nothing was built. And um, the society was still exhibiting a kind of a pioneer mentality at the time. Uh, the economy wasn't in good shape. Uh, now, of course, it's completely different. So to answer your question about differences, yeah, it's a completely different society that I've encountered from the one that I saw in 1984. The army is afraid to win decisively, either internally against uh, our internal enemies, I'll put it that way, or externally. And the court system is a law unto itself, a government unto itself that is unaccountable to the will of the people. So those are the two main differences that I've seen. A third one, I think the society has become more polarized, and this is very dangerous. I mean, under all circumstances, particularly in democracy, You don't want a polarized society. You want to hear the other side of things. You want to discuss with people civilly their opinion, even though I differ significantly from those of your own. I don't find that here anymore. We haven't become as polarized as the United States, but we're getting there right now, and this has got to stop. You've got, we've got to be able to become more civil towards one another at least acknowledge that the other side may have some good ideas that should be discussed, and maybe you could compromise and uh, reach some accommodation uh, with them. But now, no, absolutely not. In your opinion, what are the most encouraging this time aspects of Israel society and geopolitics? Encouraging yeah. signs? yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. You might, one. Yeah, I'm sure you, you no, can No, I, I think, look, we're a functioning democracy. Um, in the Middle East. In the Middle Well, we're the only functioning democracy or democracy in the Middle East. And I think we could compare favorably to every other country in the developed West. I've been very impressed, of course, with the growth of the technology industry here. Politically, the biggest problem we have here is that the politicians, for the most part, don't give a damn about the, either the country or the people. They don't seem to understand that they are accountable to the, the electorate. It's a problem inherent in our form of government because we don't have constituencies. We don't, we don't have um, right, dis was, districts. We don't have districts. I was going to say that you are, um, your perspective is also coming from America, which is uh, politically organized in a very, very different way. It is very Israel. different. True. It's very different. But he, if we had accountable legislators, if we had accountable executives in the bureaucracy... I would say, okay, it's not such a problem. But unfortunately, we don't. And because of that, governments lie. This is the problem. It's not just individuals lying like Naftali Bennett. His actions were grotesque. He lied to almost 500,000 constituents without any concern in the world. Well, yes, in the United States, there is accountability, And here there isn't. I know a lot of people 
in the Knesset who are excellent. They're wonderful people. They do care about the country. They do feel accountable to their electorate. But they're few and far between. And so while there is a glimmer, I see a glimmer of hope for our political establishment here, the press in particular um, needs to be reformed. I'm not saying that in a Stalinist way or a Leninist way. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> no. One of the key essential ingredients of a functioning democracy is a professional um, media establishment. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that here. We just don't. It's probably the most scandalous thing I've ever seen. The irresponsibility of the media in this country is shocking. And it isn't just on the left, it's on the right as well. People pretend, the writer, a lot of writers that I know present the news or present their views as, quote, news, when it's anything but that. And we're so polarized in this country that you, do, you don't know what you're reading, whether it's true or not. Now, you feel, for example, that that's not the case in America, that's not the case in England, that uh, there in these countries you do have real media? No. What I expect more from our people here because of the threats that we're facing. I'm not saying any other country is better. I mean, I've read a lot of French newspapers and magazines. I've listened to French radio. I've lived in France. I know that political uh, writing in the media in France is well-developed. It goes back to the first major newspapers after the royalty was uh, thrown out, uh, back after the uh, revolution. But we can't afford that. This is the issue. We can't afford this here. We need honest reporting by reporters that, that don't see being tendentious as a virtue. That's the problem. A reporter must not be tendentious. A, a reporter must not mask his personal views as news. Why? Because people might die here as a result. We're going this year to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel. Do you think the State of Israel has achieved its goal to be, at the same time, a Jewish and a democratic state, and at the same time, a shelter for Jews? I think two of the greatest myths that we labor under right now, or suffer from right now, is the fact, this notion that we are a Jewish and democratic state. We are neither, in my opinion. Okay. We are neither a democracy, nor are we a Jewish state. Why do I say we're not a Jewish state? There's an old notion that the beard doesn't make the Jew, right? Well, just because we have Chagim, just because we have certain uh, Shabbat laws, just because we have a Mogan David on our flag and we, whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're a religious state. So people can argue and they say, well, a Jewish state, what? Orthodox, you know, Haredi, uh, what, what do you want as a Jewish state? And the fact of the matter is most people understand what the characteristics of a Jewish state are, and we don't exhibit them at all. I'm not saying that we have to be Haredi. I'm not saying that we have to be, in fact, any stream of Judaism. There are certain essential aspects of Judaism that are, have been universally accepted as being representative of who and what we are as a religion. And this country does not exhibit those Things. It doesn't exhibit those attributes at all. What, for example, which attributes are you Well, for example, of? like Shabbat laws. Mm -hmm. They should be absolute. There's one day, one day, and I've talked to a lot of union members, as opposed to the corrupt union leadership, that feels that the Shabbat laws are, are as much a part of their rights as workers, as the religious people Shelley do. Shelly Yerimovich used to be the head of uh, exactly. Abada. She used to talk a lot about that. Correct, exactly. And she was 100% right. But what would you do with people in Israel that don't want to hear about Halacha? Well, there are certain things that mark this country as a Jewish state. If you wish to observe them, fine. If you don't, fine. For example, if somebody wants to drive on Shabbat, okay, so they drive on Shabbat. I'm not going to stop them. There's a difference between that and authorizing 
or allowing public transport to be run on that day. If you want to go to the beach on Shabbat, go to the beach. Drive your car to the beach. So people say, why can't we take a bus? We don't have a car. Well, I'm sorry. There are certain aspects of this country, if it wants to be known as a Jewish state, that have to be observed. The Kotel is another example, a prime example. For decades, liberal Jews came to the Kotel and understood that women were on one side of the mechitza, men were on the other. By and large, they didn't give a darn about the sanctity of the wall. They visit. Okay, well, if you're a visitor in somebody's house, you don't have the right to change the rules of that house. And at the Kotel, we have laws. It, okay, it goes back to the mandate, but the organization of the Kotel rests on the chief rabbinate. That's by law. We never had a problem with liberal visitors, liberal Jewish visitors coming to see the wall. We never had a problem with that until the liberal leadership. Well, if you talk to most liberal Jews, they don't care. They just came to see the wall. They abided by all the rules and regulations without, without any kind of problem. But it, was the lead, it is the leadership of the liberal Jewish community that has caused this machlochet, this problem here. And unfortunately, it's the Israeli left that has adopted their cause because what, they, what they've lost at the voting booth, what they've lost in the election, they feel they could maybe make up by gaining the alliance of the American liberal Jewish establishment. It's not based on conviction. It's based on calculation, and it's an evil calculation because it's starting up a, 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 mochlochet, a problem within the society here. And it shouldn't. I think you, while you were explaining uh, your position, you touched a core question uh, about the, the relationship between the state of Israel and the Jews around the world. Yes. Meaning, um, do Jews around the world have rights regarding to the Jewish land, the Jewish state? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. It's clear. Okay. Unless you live here, unless you put your marker down, so to speak, in this country... You have the right to come here and enjoy our society and benefit from all the fruits of our hard labor and our sacrifice and keep your mouth shut. I hate to put it that way. Unless you have a tudat zakhut, you have no rights here at all. Yeah, you can complain, you can fetch about this or that, but you don't threaten. You don't condition additional aid, for example, based on our accommodating somebody's wishes in, in the galut. It is galut. My personal belief is that... If you have an opportunity to make Aliyah and you don't, according to Rashi, it's as if you have no God, okay? And I believe that. We have a Jewish homeland. It's, by the grace of God, it was reestablished with great blood, sweat, and tears. We, we reestablished it. And now for somebody living in the lap of luxury in the Hamptons in New York or anywhere in the diaspora, in the Galut, I don't call it the diaspora. I call it what it is. It's a curse, to live in the Galut, to tell me or you or anybody else living here how we should organize our government, who should represent us, what our defense policy should be, what our economic alliances should be in the world. It isn't just a question of chutzpah. It's unacceptable. It's not a joke. I made Aliyah when I was 18. It hasn't been a very easy path. You know, it's, it's complicated. And sometimes a lot of people want to move here, but uh, it's difficult. Let's talk a little bit about the state of Israel. Do you think the state of Israel does enough nowadays? No, the short answer to that is uh, no. I'm just asking, do you think the state of Israel nowadays is doing enough to enable the Aliyah, the integration, the immigration of hundreds of thousands of Jews, millions of Jews here in Israel? No. Why not? I can give you a very cynical reason, because the powers that be in this country are afraid of bringing in too many, particularly Western Jews. When you talk about the Russians, the Russian immigration here, the Russian aliyah, you have to see it in political terms. And unfortunately, there were those people, particularly in the Jewish agency at the, in the day, that saw the immigration of non-Jews masquerading as Jews, under the law of return, which we can discuss in a minute, as undermining the orthodox or traditional, what they call stranglehold on the country. You can't look at immigration without seeing it in, unfortunately, political terms. I look at an Ethiopian Jew, 
I look at a Russian, real Russian Jew. I look at French Jews, American Jews, not as political markers, but as my brothers and sisters. I want them here. As far as the French Jewish community is concerned, we're not talking about Aliyah anymore. We're talking about a rescue mission. We are the canaries in the, in the coal mine, so to speak. We're the first ones to suffer from, well, Arab imperialism, Muslim imperialism. They haven't moderated their goals at all. They don't want to become French. They want the French to become Muslim. And they've been replicating this uh, attitude all throughout Europe. In the United States, it's, it's really political, where you have the extreme left suddenly, you know, teaming up with the extreme right. It's a red-black alliance. And who gets caught in the middle? Jews do. I have tried to tell people here that we have to see the issue of Aliyah not in traditional terms, but as a rescue mission for our people. So do you think the state of Israel needs to work harder to enable these population? Let's talk about the French, for example. The French jury that is coming here uh, should receive a better uh, welcoming, helping them to integrate. The French Aliyah right now is absolutely critical. Not just for the... Critical for the... For the state of Israel. For the state of Israel. Um, I'm very um, familiar with the dynamics of the, of the Aliyah, both within France and here as well. And yes, I could generalize and say we haven't been very good in terms of integrating anybody coming in here, either individually or collectively. But in the case of the French Jewish community, we have a wonderful opportunity to bring in some tremendous people that would really benefit this country in ways that I, I can't even begin to articulate So right why do now. you think the state of Israel doesn't do part it? Of, part of the reason, as I said, is fear over who they're going to vote for. The, the, uh, what I've heard from a lot of people on the left... Well, the French Jews usually vote to the right. Correct. The state of Israel has been led by the right for... How many years except this interruption? Well, so well, they should be interested into having more electorate. Your understanding of the right and my understanding of the right is very different from the realities on the ground here. I mean, yes, we've had the right in power for quite a while, what I call the notional right, but it wasn't a real right, not by any standard. So while it's true that the right here should naturally want Uh, 50,000 French uh, immigrants to come. Well, we don't really want to anger the French government. Every time you have Israeli politicians encouraging people to come for various reasons, you have a lot of pushback, particularly from the French government, because they somehow, the French politicians and French political leaders somehow feel that it's uh, casting an aspersion on their uh, liberté, égalité, and fraternity notion of government. Well, it's the truth, though. They've abandoned the Jewish community. The other problem is, if you have a lot of French doctors coming here, well, it threatens the establishment. If you have a lot of French engineers coming here, it's the same thing. Well, I know a lot of French doctors, and they're wonderful, and we need them desperately. I know a lot of French engineers that would benefit this country in ways that we can't even begin to imagine right now. But The establishment here doesn't want any threat, doesn't want any competition. But do you feel, for example, that the government or the people here are uh, feeling that threatened by, let's say, American Olim that would come from the U.S., then French Olim? What I hear is It's, that this is something that is being said about French, but not, for example, about Americans. Israelis are always happy to see Americans coming in and making Aliyah. It's an interesting observation you made. The attitude towards the American Aliyah is very different from the French. The American Aliyah is made up of so many different types of people. The local Israelis can kind of find their... Strevening? Their, correct. In the case of the French Aliyah, it's seen as a block, an undifferentiated block of uh, scared people that are coming uh, to vote for the right hard right, as opposed to the American Jews, who are coming here with a lot of money, and uh, they've already, a lot of them have had houses here, and it's just a different perception for the Americans. The French wave coming is except exceedingly well-educated, very well-prepared to accept the realities of 
the Arab threat, both internally and externally. They're sensitive to it because they've lived under it. That's why they're leaving. And they also, I think, unlike the Americans, have a, a far finer appreciation for what the government should do to protect them. The American Jews are still living under a, an illusion that uh, the United States is the gold in the Medina. The French Jews don't have that. You mentioned it earlier that you have an opinion regarding the Chokashvut, the, the law of return, yes. I believe, especially about this whole paragraph concerning uh, the grandparents. Nowadays in Israel, any Jewish person or any person in the world that has one Jewish grandparent has the right to make Aliyah. Correct. Do yeah. you think this is something... Do this we... should be the number one uh, law that should be uh, dispensed with. It should be changed. It should be chucked out. Chokashvut or this particular... This particular aspect. Why? First of all, I find it unseemly and unacceptable that we're using a Nazi law for determining who is a Jew and who is a mihu yudi. We're in the 21st century now. We have to be a little bit broader. This law was determined by a Nazi regime to eliminate our people. And I know what I'm going to say right now is going to be quite controversial, but it's something that I believe. And that is those people that are backing this law, the current law of return, do not want us to continue as a Jewish state. They want to bring people in that they know will dilute the Jewish character of this state. This is war by other means. So the defense of a halachic criteria for immigration is a defense of our state. Yes, the law of return has to be amended. And I'm sorry if a lot of people are going to be angry about that and see their escape route uh, cut off or the door being closed. People, particularly in the West and even in Russia, have had decades to come to grips with their interest in becoming Jews. And we have, give, we have done a disservice to these people by allowing them to believe that they don't have to study Judaism. They don't have to understand our laws and rituals and regulations. They can just come in as they are and demand to be accepted as a Jew, despite the fact that, according to religious law, they are not. So we force the Ethiopian community here to study in various facilities until they were qualified by the Rabbanut to come. Okay, why don't we do that with the Russian Jews? Do you feel that we could ask from the Ethiopians to do certain things that we cannot ask from the Russians, Ukrainians? Barur, of course. There's a little bit of, of course. racism Of course. There. And the funny thing is, the racism originally came from the left. It didn't come from the, the right wanted them in this country because they felt a genuine brotherhood with them. But it was the left that was extremely disdainful of bringing in les gens noirs. For me, when I look at an Ethiopian, I don't look at the color of their skin. I, I look at a fellow Jew. That's all I see. So to answer your question, yeah, it was racism in part, and it was also political calculation on the part of certain parties, as long as they had a pulse You can come in. We'll, we'll get you in. And then there were others that uh, saw that as a means of undermining the Jewish identity or the Jewish character of this country. I want one standard to bring anybody into this country, Bahalacha, according to Halacha. If you are a Jew, according to Halacha, I would, I would go to war to rescue you, to get you in here. We have to learn the lesson of the Khurban. No abandonment. And... From my standpoint, it's real personal with me. I know what abandonment is like, and it doesn't feel very good. I spent 30, 35 years abandoned, and I came home absolutely determined not to let anybody suffer from that ever again. Did you feel that the, the state of Israel was not there, was not trying anything to get you out? They were practicing what I called silent diplomacy, not quiet diplomacy. There were many here that didn't want me home because they lied to various commissions in terms of their involvement or knowledge of my activities. There were others that uh, felt you couldn't ruffle the feathers of the American empire, of Edom, the successor to Rome. They have a slave-like mentality to the Americans. I mean, you could understand that the, nowadays Israel's biggest ally is still the United States of America. Our biggest ally is HaKodesh Baruch Hu. All countries, particularly empires, have permanent interests, not permanent friends. 
This has been the nature of political calculation down through the ages. We have been abandoned, betrayed, lied to, and manipulated by the Americans for too long. We lost over 2,000, nearly 3,000 soldiers in the Yom Kippur War because the Americans blindsided us, lied to us, misled us, and let us bleed. But that was almost 50 years ago. Things have changed. The since mentality then. never changes. The ideology, the mentality of empires very rarely change, especially the mentality, especially when it comes to Israel. A beggar, and that's how we're perceived by the Americans, is not accorded any kind of respect or consideration. I mean, if you just happen to look at how the Americans, either, even under a, a, a perceived good government like the Trump administration treats us, this is not the behavior of an ally. Quite the opposite. The fact of the matter is, and it's important to recognize this by people that keep propagating this notion that Trump was the best president ever, that the, is Israel ever had. Well, you can't say that. Why? Because it's only in the second term of an American president that you can determine exactly where his interests lie with regard right. to Israel and the American Jewish community. There was going to be a cheshbon, a bill that had to be paid. For, and it would have been paid in land and sovereignty and our self-respect. And that's by the best perceived best president that this country has ever had to deal with, the best president. We are not given any respect at all. I say our enemies are not afraid of us. Well, I also say our so-called friends have no respect for us, and that's our fault. And that, that also has to change. So what should we do? We have to articulate and act on an independent strategic and foreign policy. That's what we have to do. If the Americans tell us you can't import certain things from China or you can't deal with the Chinese on a certain level technologically because we're at, you know, basically we're in the, in the uh, process of going to war with them, God forbid, we should tell the Americans, clean your own act up first before you come after us. We, we need an independent foreign policy. And that means dispensing immediately with American assistance. Why? Because it doesn't help us. It destroys our local military industrial base. And it also is a form of uh, subsidy or welfare, corporate welfare, for the military industrial complex in the United States. Where does the money go? The money goes to the American military industrial companies. It doesn't come here. It won't be coming here anymore. So there isn't any bit of military equipment that we're importing right now from the United States that we can't produce ourselves. Bibi, in his first speech to the uh, a joint session of uh, Congress, talked about dispensing with Israel, American foreign assistance, foreign aid to Israel, and kind of reorganizing it along the lines of joint R&D projects. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm opposed to even that. Why? Because the minute you have any American involvement in one of our projects, they have a chokehold on us in terms of where we can sell this. If you were to use this podium and give a message to the Jews around the world and to the Israelis, what would you like to tell them? The message is a very simple one. It's Yeras Shemaim, fear of heaven. I lived for 30 years in a killing field of a prison because of Hashem's grace towards me and a notion that uh, I was given by my wife, Esther, alayhi shalom, which was, you fear no one but God. This is why I'm not afraid of the Americans. I mean, they tried for 35 years to kill me, and it didn't work, only because I had no fear but heaven. This is the greatest message that has to be propagated. In, in addition to the other one, which is, Israel is your home. Come home now before the fears that you are thinking about are realized in fact. Come home in a way, in a measured way, in a responsible way, in a leisurely way where you're not running for your lives. It is the absolute lesson of history that there hasn't been one Jewish community in Galut that has been able to escape the consequences of Jew hatred. So there's no reason why the United States will be any exception to that at all. So the lesson, I guess I have two lessons that I wish people would think about. One, fear no one but God and come home before it's too late. The gates are open. Come home now. Jonathan Pollard, thank you very much.
Thank My you for pleasure. being here. Thank you.